I'm Sonia Jafari, a lecturer in the Center for Propulsion Engineering. Recently changed the name to Center for Propulsion and Thermal Power Engineering uh, at Cranfield University. Um, we are working in close collaboration with the API Department of Transportation Airbus in uh, lots of projects in hydrogen power aircraft recently. We led the new H2 project and recently started a new project with Airbus, uh, another innovative new project. Uh, specifically in my group, we are concentrated on developing digital twins uh, to uh, performance analysis of hydrogen power vehicles from uh, small sizes to different classifications. And we also uh, are working on developing the home through system strategy for hydrogen power aircraft in terms of thermal and energy management systems. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, Good afternoon, Naresh Kumar, uh, Sustainability Advisor for Aerospace Technologies Institute, uh, formerly Chief of Environmental Technology for Rolls-Royce, uh, aeronautical engineer by trade. Um, Greg gave me a very nice introduction in terms of the Fly Zero project, which was undertaken last year. Uh, it brought together uh, 100 experts from the aerospace industry and independence uh, within the UK to look at uh, how we could decarbonize aviation. And as Greg said, uh, this is a sector which has huge challenges on that front, uh, partly uh, driven by uh, safety and reliability, but mostly driven by the fact that we have to carry the fuel in the air and we can't stop anywhere to plug the batteries in or to refuel, uh, although the military can do that. Uh, not plug the airplanes in. Um, the conclusion from the Fly Zero project last year was that liquid hydrogen offers the highest prospects for truly decarbonizing aviation uh, in the long term. Um, and as Greg said, uh, there are plans uh, within the aviation sector. Some of you will know that Airbus has already um, uh, declared an intent to fly first uh, hydrogen powered aircraft by 2035. So Fly Zero uh, did the detailed analysis uh, from a technology point of view uh, to design uh, regional aircraft, narrow body aircraft, and mid size aircraft. Uh, which would be powered by liquid hydrogen. And, and just to reinforce the point, I'm sure everybody's aware, uh, but the reason that hydrogen is, is, is so good, uh, a fuel particularly for, hydri hyd for aviation, is that it's three times energy dense compared to current kerosene fuel that we use. Uh, uh, but you have to take it in a liquid form. Okay? Uh, so these aircraft uh, are designed to replace today's aircraft uh, with the same ranges. In fact, the mid-size aircraft that's been designed can have a range uh, exceeding 5,000 nautical miles. So you can circumnavigate the globe with one stop, by and large. 93% of long-haul flights can be replaced. 100% of the short-haul flights for aviation can be replaced by hydrogen. Uh, my team did the sustainability analysis on liquid hydrogen and taking everything into account in terms of eliminating tailpipe emissions and the full life cycle analysis, taking into account NOx, uh, contrails, water vapor emissions, and the emissions associated with manufacturing and liquidifying the hydrogen in, in the first place uh, shows hydrogen to be better than definitely kerosene but also sustainable aviation fuel so this is a true long-term solution for aviation that i'm really really excited about in terms of its viability going forward fantastic thank you look forward to uh, finding out a little bit more about this and um all right please yeah hello everyone my name is Ian Jeffy from Concord Blue Engineering uh, our company Concord Blue is a uh, holding the headquarter is in based in US and I'm from Germany from computer engineering uh, company. We are a turnkey waste management company. 
and uh, yeah, our plans based on our attended uh, technology have been implemented worldwide so far. But recently, we have focused on waste to hydrogen. It's pity that uh, today so far nobody talked about waste to hydrogen. And so I'm here to talk a bit about that kind of potential that this uh, technology can provide. And uh, yeah, business development people also here. Yep, thanks. Excellent. Well, on that note, what can you tell us about waste <laughs> to hydrogen for, uh, for, for the aviation <clears throat> sector? How, how, uh, how sustainable and how much of the demand can it, uh, can it, uh, can it be? Yeah, uh, in fact, I'm not trying to advertise the company itself, but I'm trying to, to tell you about this gasification technology, the potential that this technology can bring. Uh, if I go uh, to that, before that, in the uh, bigger picture, when I go about the solution for, for the uh, energy sector, we say that three aspects of, uh, of the energy sector should be made by a solution at the same time. That is sustainability, affordability, and accessibility or the uh, security of supply. And the, the question is that if there is a single technology that can provide such a solution, if uh, the, the uh, yeah, gentlemen and the ladies uh, today, they were uh, mainly from the electrochemical section, is that affordable? Is this technology very affordable? I say that we, as a part of this solution, technology solution, waste to energy, waste to hydrogen, we can provide you, for some cases, more sustainable, more affordable, and more accessible for the waste to hydrogen. So our solution, in some cases, can be more competitive than the solutions that nowadays is uh, more uh, on uh, the TV and, and the, the, the social media. This is the scene. And uh, so, about uh, we are uh, in, in the main uh, issues from the uh, energy tech review, our company for the, the technology uh, was uh, announced and won the award for top bioenergy solution provider for this year, 2022. And so I think this things is that shows that there are so many potential for that. Excellent. Um, great. Yeah, that's putting you on the spot. Is, is, that, is that something that's been considered uh, to, uh, to a great detail with the, um, uh, the decarbonisation plan for aviation? Uh, certainly. Uh, I don't know in terms of the question is this is like can airports generate sufficient hydrogen uh, on site and doing it for growing waste and I think most of the predictions are on the what's going to be too challenging uh, given the amount of fuel uh, given the amount of use um, lots of things going on airports uh, including uh, very important revenue generation things like car parking which takes up, take up lots of space um, Fly zero looks a little bit as well. Um, so, we have a smaller end of the market, maybe start off with uh, on site production. It could work quite well, but I might be thinking to the air for sort of long term solution. So, did you? Are you yeah, please. <laughs> That's pretty good. The content is what you A typical narrow body aircraft. Um, so, this is a typical airplane uh, that we all fly to Europe on for example, on holiday, okay, narrow body aircraft. It uses four tons of liquid hydrogen. Yes. And, and therefore, I, I think that stream that you talk about will be limited because of feedstock. Yes. And, and taking the point that Greg quite rightly made, uh, the actual processing technology, you know, if, if you had to do it on site, 
would be would be uh, also a, a big challenge compared to some of the pictures that we've seen today about electrolysis machines as well as liquefaction machines which are much much more compact yes so if you can overcome those challenges and supply uh, four tons of liquid hydrogen per aircraft mission at, at an airport then we can talk turkey yeah sure 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 yeah in fact we have a commercial project right now that is providing 2,000 tons of hydrogen per year based on waves from agriculture. And uh, that was a study that Sohel calculated for us. And uh, I remember that was based on your calculation that was sufficient for a statistic that you calculated between Frankfurt and London for the flight, the commercial flight. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. yeah. If you take a look at the most busiest route in the Euro pre-COVID situation, of course, uh, it was London Heathrow to Dublin. We had already almost in average 39 flights per day on average. So uh, it needs something around 120 tons of kerosene per day. If I want to take on average point about the specific density of the hydrogen, we need at least 42 tons of hydrogen per day just to feed, get yeah, just for, for this line from London Heathrow to uh, Dublin. So it's the most busiest route in the euro. So sorry, we cannot go ahead. Yeah, that was about the uh, things. And you calculated that this kind of plan that we are providing to a customer of ours is enough for that, uh, for that. Decentralized, yeah, decentralized. Yeah. So you see that even in commercial scale that's possible to use it but for sure there are some challenges about how to make as you said how to uh, integrate this kind of technology inside the waste management system of an vehicle this is the things that we are doing right now to risk analysis uh, yeah considering different aspects of the topic how to make it with the standards that there is in European standards for aviation. But still, I'm confident that it's a way that can be at least considered. Well, this is interesting. It's our first heated slide <laughs> <laughs> uh, discussion, which is, which is, dare I ask, what's the best hydrogen solution, hydrogen production solution for, uh, for decarbonizing the, uh, the aviation sector? Or are we too busy stuck on what's the best rather than what will work as a system? Um, well, it's, it's not a nice question, I but um, I guess it's with a very minus global nature for the sector. Um, so, however, to the east, uh, we will need hydrogen or a the common standard uh, available across the world. Five minutes B, you need to be able to refuel B, so. Um, uh, it doesn't have like global consistency. Um, it might take us a little bit of range of uh, production methods in different parts of the world. Um, we're getting better equipped um, to use hydrogen in different ways. I guess from an end user perspective, um, as long as there's some commonality in price um, and some sort of common safety standard, um, we can find a nice, nice one percent of the need. I would certainly echo that. Um, I, I, th I think um, I think a lot of the other sectors have already also mentioned it. Electrolysis is ob the obvious way to, to, to make hydrogen uh, at quantity uh, for all of the sectors in the long term, um, and that will require a huge amount of electricity. Okay, so uh, we know that many nations across the planet are uh, aggressively developing renewable energy uh, capabilities, solar, wind, offshore wind, uh, and many others. Um, and given that aviation, uh, if, it, if it does all of the research and technology that it needs to do uh, to, to, to realize the, the, the concepts that have been defined here uh, over the next uh, 12 to 15 years, then by that time, uh, we hope that 
the hydrogen uh, infrastructure and the hydrogen production capability will also have matured very significantly. But certainly the analysis that we did in Fly Zero indicates that the long-term prospects for high-scale uh, hydrogen will come through electrolysis. Totally agree with uh, what you said, uh, Norish, about the long-term plan for 2030. Green hydrogen, I mean, renewable electrolysis would be you know, the solution, and government has a clear plan to reduce the cost of green hydrogen development to, I think, two pounds per kilogram of hydrogen, which is currently six to 13, based on the type and area, of course. Uh, do you think for, for short and medium term, blue hydrogen would be a solution? Because I think it's, I mean, natural gas, the same gas and CO2 removal, it's cost effective at the moment, reliable. I know there are lots of problems with nat natural gas leakage. And of course, the global warming potential of methane is 28 times of, let's say, CO2. But what do you think for short to medium term? I think from the propulsion aspect, propulsion point of view, I would be happy with blue hydrogen for at least five to 10 years from now. I, 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 we, we didn't actually go sufficiently in detail to be able to answer that question. But my slight reservation is, is one that Greg alluded to earlier on, which is to do with uh, certification and standards. Aviation is particularly sensitive and because uh, we have to make sure that safety and reliability are never ever compromised. And for that reason, I think there is a strong argument to actually do, one of my colleagues from Marshall Aerospace, we were talking about the coffee time, and you know, you have to do a top-down uh, uh, analysis based on certification requirements to agree that you are not going to compromise some of the really, really well-established safe, safety and reliability systems um, uh, before making uh, a jump to that kind of solution. And I do, I do believe that we, we, we need to devote the investment in research and technology uh, in order to actually answer those questions quickly. Thank you, and uh, also enjoying helping Henry out with the role of water racing. That's <laughs> very welcome. Um, Greg, you mentioned earlier the statistic you used is 38 percent uh, in, in terms of the maximum the hydrogen could, could, could help in terms of, uh, of, of decarbonisation. Is that based on flight numbers or CO2 <laughs> emission equivalent? Uh, yes, I was based on traffic emissions, traffic emissions, and the I think sustainable aviation fuel has a critical role to play uh, in the short to medium term, uh, supporting what Greg said. Uh, it, it, the reason for that is, is that aviation is characterized by uh, a, a long life cycle as an industry. Aircraft typically stay in service for 30 years plus. Um, and, and therefore, 
for the, 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 the immediate and midterm, we are going to have aircraft which will need to rely on burning synthetic kerosene, which is what sustainable aviation fuel is. Now, uh, whether you make it out of uh, waste uh, yep. food, whether you make it out of biofeedstocks, which might be algae, geotropha, and many other sources, there are about seven different pathways for sustainable aviation that have already been approved by the, the industry. And therefore, those uh, pathways will help to decarbonize the current fleet of aircraft, but at the same time, it's really important that we recognize that the long-term solution is to switch over to hydrogen as soon as we can. So uh, the, the 35, 38% that Greg talked about is actually quite a large figure. If you think about aviation CO2 emissions in 2019, they amounted to about 920 million tons of CO2. So if you take 35% of that, you're talking, well, it's the third, isn't it? 300 million tons of CO2 saving per year. And given that aviation is still growing at a rate of around 4% a year, that will help to offset the emissions that aviation is going to continue to generate. And when we switch over to hydrogen, uh, that will then give us a long-term plan, uh, which will contribute almost exponentially uh, towards 2050 and beyond as you get through that 30-year aircraft life cycle. Thank you. And you really touched upon the, 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 uh, the safety certification uh, requirements for, for aviation. So how much of an impact is that going to play in terms of being able to get these uh, you know, the, the new hydrogen propulsion systems into service? So, um, like, like most other sectors, we, we, we don't envisage any fundamental uh, blockers, uh, uh, but there is a fair amount of technology research that needs to be done in order to satisfy the certification requirements that we're used to uh, from the Civil Aviation Authority, uh, EASA and the FAA uh, across the globe. Um, and, and those uh, certification requirements will have to uh, uh, be based on demonstrating that the technologies uh, are fully um, uh, fully prepared before they go into service. And this is one of the main reasons why uh, we are pushing really hard for hydrogen technology to be worked on now in order to be in a position by 2035 uh, to uh, get the first aircraft in the air. Um, you mentioned earlier, actually, very useful in your presentation around the, the effects of water emissions. Um, can we discuss that a little bit more in the, from the Fly Zero project? There's some, uh, some, some findings come out there. Uh, yeah, I'm Nate. I'm Tim Nate. I'm Solution. Sam Swiss is still my degree of uncertainty. Hands up who's seen these streaks behind the aeroplanes at, on a sunny day, like today, yeah? Condensation trails. Um, 
they're, they're not all bad, but some of them are bad. Yeah, you know this. Um, so, so most of the time when you look at the airplane, you see this white streak and it kind of disappears behind the airplane. So most of them last for uh, minutes, uh, maybe a few hours. Uh, but the ones to worry about are the contrails that are formed at night, which you can't see, I can't see. Yeah, because those, uh, and they only form in super saturated regions of the atmosphere. Don't forget that at, at flight altitude, the ambient temperature is around minus 50, minus 60 degrees C. You can see it on your dial when you're sitting in front of the terminal behind the, uh, the, the seat. Um, so any water vapor will freeze if it's super saturated and the humidity is high. Uh, at night, some of those things will linger. They're called persistent contrails. Uh, and if they linger, they might turn into cirrus clouds. Uh, if they do, they cause warming. So the concern is that if you're burning hydrogen, you're potentially generating 2.6 times the amount of water vapor in its emissions than with kerosene or SAF, okay? So you're gonna generate more contrails, but these contrails typically form around particulates. So current uh, jet engines produce particulates from the fuel and they form around those particulates. With hydrogen, you have very little particulates. So the type of contrail that will form, uh, we did this study with Leeds University last year uh, in depth, uh, they, they will be um, uh, uh, different. Different in the sense that the ice particle sizes will be heavier, uh, therefore they will fall quicker, they will, they will dissipate faster. So when we did the uh, uh, measurements uh, uh, through life cycle analysis, uh, sorry I'm going to become a geek here, global warming potential, anybody heard of that? As opposed to radiative forcing. So if you measure it in global warming potential uh, characteristics, which is the long term, uh, global warming effect, right? Uh, you can calculate the total life cycle analysis. And we believe that the total impact from that water is not going to be, it's going to be either about the same or less than today's airplanes. So we're not worried about that. Uh, there's a little bit of water that is emitted at altitude, which might be in the uh, uh, stratosphere uh, above the tropicals. Uh, and that's not good, but currently that's about 2%. So that might increase a little bit, and we do need to do some more research in order to actually make sure that that is not going to be problematic as we go forward. Uh, and, and this is one of the areas of research that we've identified uh, in our work from FlyZero. So there's lots of R&D that needs to be done, and that's just a flavor of the kind of science that we need to get under our belt, as well as the certification to support it. Well, thank you very much. Um, I will throw over to the uh, question from Ben. Get the microphone. So I just yell. Yeah, go for it. Uh, super interesting. Um, Master do looking forward to reading the report. Uh, They're online, ATI. ATI, ATI. excellent. Um, but I, I, it's a sort of twin track question. What, what I'm really interested in, I mean, if we flew the guys from planes in the 70s, or something like that, with you know, on one engine and things like that. See, we've kind of known that the hydrogen potentially existed for some time, but I'm really interested to understand what changed. I mean, you mentioned Paris, and is it all just regulatory pressure, or were there some technological changes or technological realizations that, that caused a sort of a bit of a damascene conversion? And then, and then sort of linked to that, is this damascene conversion amongst you know, you, you apply the sustainability, you know, the most sustainability queen of the aviation industry. I, I see Airbus starting to make kind of quite bold noises about the hydrogen planes and things like that. To what extent is, is this kind of, this big hydrogen solution is um, across the entire piece, or is it still a, you know, that's what the environmentalists have started to achieve consensus on. You can give us a, a sense of that. And then just finally, on the SAP argument, I don't think you can read it. The, the, the question is why not just stop at SAP? I mean, so Good thing for but I didn't quite get the argument about why not stop, why not just stop there. So, if you're able to use the site today, either from a, your own environmental perspective or from a policy perspective, that would be really interesting. Do you want to do a policy for Um Yeah, so it's not to be uh, your last point first. Uh, 
perspective, we're, we're not looking to um, sell the industry uh, which solutions to be. We, most of our scenarios show you need both, you need SAF, all the SAF you can get, probably all the hydrogen you can get, and then to use it directly, and then you've still got um, quite a lot of emissions to deal with um, by 2050. Um, so it's about how much to keep your options open um, rather than uh, closing it down. And I'm so specifically on this green hydrogen point um, for our scenarios, both on how to look at the sun, but also on the combustion of hydrogen inside, where it's going to be market, regardless of which path irrigation follows. Um, yeah, so some stage of the market, that would just be a need for some of green hydrogen. Uh, well, I have a further question on the loss change in the, uh, in the technology. Um. So yes, uh, the industry has looked at hydrogen before, but at a cursory level. Um, last year was, was, was a truly remarkable piece of um, support that we got from industry and government uh, in order to undertake Fly Zero. So we brought together 100 experts, as I said, uh, in order to do the analysis. So, and that was driven partly by uh, the Jet Zero part of the 10-point plan from the UK government. Uh, uh, ahead of uh, COP26. So all these things came together, really, in order to do that analysis. Um, um, and, and it was really, really worthwhile because um, people like Airbus, Rolls-Royce, GKN, uh, and others from the UK all got together, as well as uh, all of the uh, experts in academia from Cranfield, from Southampton, from Oxford, Cambridge, etc., etc. We have about 40 universities working with us in order to do the uh, analysis. Uh, so, so it, it, it all came together in, in that kind of way. Um, so, so why not stop with SAF? Um, th there is a, um, an, a piece of analysis. Again, you'll find it in our reports. Um, so, currently. The amount of SAF that is available to the industry, so let's go back before the pandemic, 2019, is less than 1% of the fuel. And why is that? Because uh, th there isn't the, the, the market driver to push that solution at a cost-effective means into the aerospace sector. So, so the volume uptake and the feedstocks are there. If you look at a projection going forward, there is a limited, a number of people have done this analysis, that the feedstock is limited, will not supply the entire capability for aviation as it continues to grow at 4% a year. So beyond 2035, most of the SAF increases will come through what's called power to liquid, where you synthesize it from, guess what? Hydrogen and carbon monoxide. So why create the hydrogen and then find some carbon monoxide converted to a synthetic fuel? It takes 40% more energy to produce the synthetic fuel than it would by using the hydrogen directly. So you're sort of almost helping to fund the work that needs to go into the new technology where you will achieve zero tailpipe emissions and you won't have a limit on scale. That's why. I mean, this conviction that you were showing is, is really important, I think, for the wider hydrogen industry because it points yes. to the supply chain. Yes. We take the balance for some of the areas where there's a more marginal decision on, on, on which hydrogen routes go. Yep. So, so to the extent that your conviction in the uh, aviation industry is universal, it, it has indications for a choice of fuel for trucking and choice of fuel for, for, for lugging large quantities of hydrogen around the globe. Okay. So I, I, think, I think it's very interesting to understand you know, how universal that conviction is and the point at which you can consider it. You know, one great report, right? And in fact, a, a great report with a lot of people behind it, so it's brilliant. But the point at which you then consider that to have actually spread and, and be a, a, a bankable certainty that it's going to be a good market play. Agreed. 
So Dinesh from University of Southampton. So hydrogen is quite flammable and uh, it's uh, very explosive and flammable. So do you have a, a safety regulation framework when you want to utilize hydrogen for aviation applications? Not yet. Uh, but those are the things that we need to work on. Uh, and we are already in dialogue uh, with uh, industry experts and the aviation authorities in order to actually understand uh, and following the same processes that we have for everything else in terms of um, certification requirements in order to come up with uh, the solutions that we need. So it, it's things like, not, not just about, uh, let's give you an example, leak detection. Uh, and, and then dealing with any, any leaks, um, uh, handling the tank, uh, the uh, refueling system um, uh, at the apron uh, when the aircraft is docked, so aircraft turnaround, all of the safety requirements, how close can you get to it, how, how far do you have to stay away, all of those things have to be done, uh, but we don't think that's unsurmountable. Yeah. The rockets and lots of other people use hydrogen and oxygen, which is even more explosive. So, uh, so these things need work on. And for one more question down the back. Yeah. Hey, hi, I'm Lee McCarthy from Select again. Um, so, in the past, uh, we've tried to engage on the ground side of the airports on the hydrogen generator success. Um, do you think there's an opportunity here to coordinate that? So not just hydrogen for aircraft, but also hydrogen on the ground side, auxiliary power units, materials handling, and then using for weight to make the air for hydrogen for the um, Is there any possibility there, or are there two separate businesses? Excellent question. Um, and I think there is a huge potential for that to be done. Uh, because if you look at how airports operate today, they have uh, typical medium-sized airports will have electricity, they will have gas, they will have kerosene storage, three, three, basically three types of fuels for, for, for different applications on the airport. But if you're going to get hydrogen, and certainly listening to what's been discussed today, uh, there's absolutely a huge potential for that to be coordinated. Um, and and we're, we're lucky in the aerospace sector in that the community is quite small and compact and, and we do have uh, plenty of forums where we can discuss these things and, and actually say, well, if we're doing that, what's the potential for doing that? There are some pilot works going on with some um, airports. Greg mentioned three of them at Cranfield, at uh, uh, Cotswolds, uh, and uh, Teesside. Teesside, yeah. So, so there are uh, already some projects which are going along those lines, and and their dream it is not just to supply the uh, aircraft, but what what's the broader uh, potential? Okay, thank you very much. So we've uh, unfortunately run out of time, but it's uh, time for a break, so you'll be able to uh, pick up any questions if you get them downstairs. So, round of applause, thank you.